Well, welcome. Glad you're here this morning on this 4th of July weekend that you could come out and uh, join with us. Again, if you're visiting with us this morning, love to have a record of your visit. There's some cards in the back of your uh, pews there. Uh, I don't come around and bother you just because you fill out a card unless you request it. But there's visitation requests on there. But if you also have prayer needs, please put those on those cards and then put them in that offering box on the, the back wall there. And we can uh, give those their due, their due consideration. Um, again, uh, glad to be here this morning with you. This is, of course, Fourth of July uh, weekend. This uh, weekend we celebrate our independence, uh, our freedom, our liberty from a, a kingly government, namely a fellow by the name of King George. Freedom from tyranny and injustice isn't easy. It costs everything. And it's easy for us, though, 200 plus years down the road, to take those things for granted. So as we pray this morning in our, our time together, we need to be thankful that what we have is precious. A lot of folks this morning uh, aren't woken, waking up to a weekend of independence. They're still under tyranny. Uh, and injustice. So, not lest we forget those things. I'll be reading from the Declaration of Independence just a little bit this morning. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's interesting, it begins, that communication is key. We ought to be able to talk about our differences, that only war is the last when we quit talking to each other and quit deciding those things in that way. Later on, in this uh, declaration, and it lists all those injustices, one by one, that need to be righted, and all of those wrongs. And then it concludes, in that declaration that we celebrate tomorrow, uh, we, uh, we, with a firm reliance, on the protection of divine providence, that's God, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And literally, they did that. They were odds against odds, we should have lost that revolution. This raggedy band of, of colonizers, colonizers who uh, wanted their, their, their independence from the injustice, they pledged everything in this document their lives you know if we would have lost the revolutionary war which we probably should have with an overwhelming power of of england of britannia uh where would the heads of uh of uh, george washington and john hancock and ben franklin and paul revere been probably on pikes shipped back to the tower of london to be put on display as traitors it's funny how that works that way who is a hero and who ends up being a traitor all depends on who wins the war. They pledged their fortunes. Many of them were bankrupted after the Revolutionary War. George Washington bought horses for his cavalry. Others bought the uniforms for their soldiers uh, that, that would have to, to, to fight in, in that war. They pledged everything they had and their lives and their honor. Their honor, boy, they were gambling their honor. Either they were going to be traitors or they're going to be heroes. But because of God's providence, it ended out that they got that honor and they did not lose their honor. So, this morning, uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer on this weekend, uh, we need to thank God for independence. We need to thank God that we have an Independence Day. And we need to thank God for those who sacrificed so much that we might, uh, we might have a day like this. So, let us begin our time together this morning with a prayer for our independence. Let us pray.
morning we have a new memory verse in your order of worship there, there for this month of July, taken from Colossians 1.11. And if you notice, those first three words are in uh, parentheses because that's not in the original. And so we set those out. It really says being, but that's kind of uh, obscure. So to help you memorize the verse and to make it personal, uh, it's been uh, transliterated to be may you be uh, strengthened instead of just, just being. So if you've uh, got that before you, if you say with me the reference before and after, Colossians 1.11. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might so that you might have great endurance and patience. Colossians 1.11. Well, that's a great verse, isn't it? Uh, times in your life you could pull that out when we need that patience and we need that endurance and I'm sure we all we all need that. Again, if you've got your order of worship there, our call to worship is taken from 1 John 1.17. So if you've got that in your hymnal, turn to 408, How Firm a Foundation. 408 in your hymnal. How Firm a Foundation. And if you've uh, got that in your order of worship, and you can stand with me this morning if you're able, and you can, would like to, and we will, uh, and then our call to worship. But if we walk in the light, and yes, he is. is we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Scripture reading this morning is found in the Gospel of John, 
chapter 14, if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles or your pew Bibles there. Just a few verses this morning, verses 23 through 27. Scripture reading for the calendar of the church. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love him will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not mine own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Please stand and turn to number 337, Nothing But the Blood. <laughs> Please be seated. All right. And as always, before we uh, get into Scripture this morning, let's invoke God's help. Father, again, we thank you that we can come together on this uh, weekend. We have this beautiful place, dear Lord, that you've prepared for us to get in out of the weather and uh, to spend a little time turning our thoughts and attention to you, dear Lord. Again, we give you thanks for the freedom that we have 
to share our faith with all those around us. The freedom we have as a community. Pray for all of our churches this morning that the gospel message, sweet and true, would go out. Dear Father and folks, men, women, and children who don't know you would bow their heads, bow their hearts, and receive you into their lives. Thank you for the freedom we have to do that. Pray we continue, dear Father, to have free course to, to minister to those around us. Pray for the hurting this morning. So many of this little sickness going around again. Uh, so many this morning can't be here. Some in nursing homes. Some stove up at home and can't get out. Uh, others uh, uh, awaiting test results. Dear Father, we pray for them this morning. That uh, Even as our memory verse we looked at this morning, you give them endurance and impatience that you empower them by your Holy Spirit. That they know that you know what it is they're going through, dear Lord, and know your comfort by the counselor, by the comforter that you sent to be upon your church. So we pray for them as well. And we pray for ourselves. Illumine our hearts and minds, even as we've lit these candles this morning, our alkalite, uh, lit them for us, dear Lord. It's symbolic that you would illuminate our lives, dear Lord, our eyes, to see what it is you have in your word for us today. So many different needs, so many folks in so many different places in their lives. We pray each and every need will be met in you this morning according to thy gracious will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do we have any young people this morning to be dismissed to their time together with their helpers? For their lesson this morning? We are in Revelation chapter 11 this morning, looking at verses 15 through 19. Again, if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles or your, your pew Bibles there. The best known prayer in Christianity is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And again, because of all the various translations, and forgive us our debts. Some says sins, some say transgressions, as we also forgive our debtors or those who have sinned against us or transgressed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now that prayer is known and recited throughout the languages of the world. It begins with two simple words, our Father. In fact, in many lands across the world, it is referred to as simply the Our Father. We probably know it better in America as our, the Lord's Prayer, uh, but rather than Our Father. In uh, Pater Noster in Latin, uh, uh, Pater, Pater Nostro in Italian, Our Father it is known as in most of the parts of the world. Now, many churches incorporate the Our Father into their worship service every time they have it. Believers in the world over have, rec have recited this as kind of a personal devotion that they do every day. In fact, this tradition goes back to the first century of the church. In the Dedicae, which is the teaching of the apostles, it is said there that Christians were taught in the first century church to recite this prayer three times a day. And it became kind of a, a personal anthem, a personal devotion in reciting this prayer. Now, we've talked about that before. It's kind of a good idea if you think about it. We said when you roll out of bed in the morning, at that moment, you decide who's going to be on the throne of your life that day. You're going to put Jesus there or you're going to put yourself there? Is it his calendar or is it your calendar? Well, imagine three times a day. You roll out of bed in the morning, our Father, and you put him back where he belongs on his throne, who art in heaven. Thy will be done. And accepting everything that happens that day is the will of God. Praying for daily bread. Tomorrow belongs to God, but just that day. But every day, and then at lunchtime, you know, time you go to work and you hear the Lord's name used in vain about 20, 30 times, if you ever work construction like I did in other jobs, uh, you get pretty wore out. But by the time you get to lunchtime, you open up that old uh, lunchbox or that uh, brown bag, and you say, Our Father, who art in heaven... He's still there. He's still on the throne. And then at night, regardless of what's on the, the nightly news, you go to bed, our Father, who art in heaven. The world is not out of control. 
The world is unfolding according to His immutable plan, as we've even seen in the book of Revelation, which is really what that's about, in putting Him back. By the time that John wrote this book of Revelation, reciting the Lord's Prayer had likely become a widespread practice among the churches, including the seven churches in Asia that Peter is writing to, praying the Our Father. Though believers have offered this prayer our Father since the founding of the early church, some elements of that prayer are yet to be answered fully. Literally, here in Revelation 11, chapter 15 through 19 that we're going to study this morning, we see the beginning of the answer to our Father, literally. God answers prayers. And we get a glimpse of that in this chapter this morning. 2,000 years of patient trusting, the prayer of the faithful, praying the Our Father, is being answered fully in this text of Scripture. It's a lesson about patience in prayer, endurance in prayer, waiting for God, believing that He's going to answer it, but waiting for His time in his way. And if we've seen before in many of the numbers that we've seen in the book of Revelation, the number seven or seventy keeps coming up, the number of perfection in his perfect time, in the fullness of time, in the complete time, God will fully bring it in. Spiritually, we live into Christ's kingdom, and Christ's kingdom is to live in us. We submit to his rule. As our Lord, confessing Him as Lord. We submit to His commands, His kingdom manifesto found in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes we also call it. We serve our King. In Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom has come. The kingdom, He said, is not very far from you. Paul, in addressing the Jewish leaders in Rome in Acts chapter 28, said, Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. In the spiritual sense, Christ's kingdom has come. It came with the, the king, the prince of peace, as he ushered in his kingdom with the, his beatitudes. In the spiritual sense, it rules and reigns in our hearts. In Colossians 1.13, it says, For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into his kingdom of the sons that he loves. That's where we're supposed to be. Spiritually, in His kingdom, where Christ rules over. Our citizenship is in the kingdom. Oh, we've been assigned here for a little while. But our citizenship is to serve, to serve our King. And it's interesting, in Colossians 1.13, it's in past tense. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, of these old dark kingdoms and dark world, dark, uh, Babylon, Egypt, uh, called many different things. To serve Him in His kingdom now. We have already been rescued. The good news of Jesus' spiritual kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. However, as we live into that kingdom. As we are members of that kingdom. A day is coming when the Lord's prayer will be answered literally. Beginning with the sounding of the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11. Christ will one day reign over all the earth, not just our hearts. The world will be transformed. Sin and death will be no more. God's promises will be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. The Our Father prayer will be fully answered. What a day, the songwriter wrote, glorious day, that will be. But remember, Christ's kingdom will be preached will be preceded by a time of judgment that we've been reading about in Revelation. A trumpet blast, then a booming voice, a heavenly choir, lightning, thunder, earthquakes, and hail will rock the earth. 
With the sounding of the seventh and final trumpet, God prepares John for the seven plagues or vials or bowls, depending on your translations of wrath, that are going to be pointed out upon the earth, ushering in Christ's glorious reign, ushering in the kingdom. So a question for us is this. Do you understand when you pray, Our Father, thy kingdom come, what you're praying for? And what will happen at that last trumpet to men who have refused all their lifetimes to believe, to bow their hearts, and to be a child of the kingdom? Let's read our text this morning. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven, heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has, past tense, become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have, be, have, have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was open, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, and earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. Just three points this morning as we look at the angel, the 24 elders, and the temple. A seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Though the full results from the sounding of the seventh trumpet are only introduced here, like a lot of the book of Revelation, something is introduced, it's not chronological, and then it goes back and explains it a little bit further in more detail as it goes along, a common way of writing in the ancient world. In fact, Hollywood uses it too uh, when they flash forward or flash back to, to bring out the details that brings it to that point. So as the trumpet sounded, voices were heard in heaven. And think about this. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. A forever kingdom. You know, our history is the rising and falling of nations and wars over and over and over and over again. Two kingdoms in conflict, it's often pictured as. St. Augustus wrote a book called The City of God. I have it in my library, by the way. It was the most influential book in Christianity for almost a thousand years, and then even found its way into the Reformation. To Zingli, Calvin, uh, and uh, Luther refers to that book. Its essence is about, from the beginning, there are two cities. And they've always been at war with each other. You might call them two kingdoms. Two communities. One is the city of man, and one is the city of God. It's that city of God that will come, that we've been praying for. The city of man, the mark of the beast, which is the number of man, 666. You either serve the city of man, this world, whether it be Egypt, it talked about, whether it be Sodom and Gomorrah, whether it be Babylon. There has always been a kingdom you give yourself to, or do you give yourself to the kingdom? Christ's kingdom, in which Christ rules and reigns sovereignly. When the trumpet sounds, the kingdom of the world, and notice it's past tense, has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Victory! God has shown us in Scripture the answer to our prayers that we win. In the end, his kingdom does come. By faith, we can live into that now. If we believe God's word, it's a done deal. We're just waiting for the fullness of time, for that perfect time when that takes place. And you say, well, why the delay? Scripture explains that to us. Why the delay? Because God is long-suffering and merciful. He is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. That as many as possible before that day get saved. But there is a day. 
in which justice will be done. There are many prophecies of the kingdom of the world and, and, and the kingdom of Christ, Messiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Daniel's a great one, Zechariah, we don't have time to look at all those this morning, but just to, just to give you a gleaning about looking forward to this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Ezekiel 21, uh, verse 26 and 27, take off the turban, remove the crown, it will not be as it was, the lowly will be exalted, and the exalted will be brought low. A ruin, a ruin, I will make a ruin. The crown will not be restored until he whom it rightfully belongs shall come to him, and I will give it to him. When Christ comes to rule and reign, all other crowns, all other turbans, whatever you call yourself, is done away with. There is but one king. In Daniel 2, verses 35, that, remember that great statue that Daniel had a vision of? Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, all pictures of diff different countries back in then, Mesopotamia and Greece and Rome, the two legs and Babylon. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, and the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces, and they became like chaff, dust on the threshing floor in the summer. The great statue of all the nations of the world, the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. The kingdoms of this earth have become the kingdom of our, of our God. In Daniel 24, 44, we read, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but itself will endure forever. Daniel saw this coming, and he was waiting for the kingdom to come too. Zechariah 14, 9, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord, one king in his name, the only name. Daniel 4, 3. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. And of course, my favorite is Psalm 2. It answers for me a lot of questions about what's going on in the world today. There we read, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? I mean, look at all the shuffling that's going on internationally. And one nation trying to overtake another nation, get more territory here and, 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 and get a better economy and conquer this part of the world and on and on. It's been going on from the beginning. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. See, God already has an anointed king, but they don't want him to be the king. They say, let us break their chains and throw off their fetters, their, their shackles. In other words, we don't want to serve that God. We don't want to do what Jesus says. The one enthroned in heaven, what does he do? He laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger. He terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession, and you will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the sun, or he will be angry, and you will be led to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Maybe the sounding of this seventh trumpet is that wrath being flared in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 2 tells us. The seventh trumpet introduces and includes the seven bold judgments or vile judgments of wrath that follow it. In contrast with the previous trumpets uh, where a, a signal was heard, here a mighty chorus in heaven is joined in this proclamation. When the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, heaven breaks forth in praise. The age-old prayer of the church of our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven will be answered prayer. 
Literally. Finally, the kingdom prophecies that span both the Old and the New Testaments will be fully, completely, perfectly, number seven, perfection realized. Let's talk about these elders, secondly, this morning. And upon this happening, the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. You finally answered that prayer. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Now, I could spend a lot of time there this morning uh, about what that is saying. Uh, I would say that there's a good basis for Christian ecology here. He's going to destroy those who destroyed the earth. You know, I'm an old hippie, and I can remember at a sit-in I was at when I was in high school, in which we all sat in the uh, front lawn and took the American flag down and put up an Ecology Day flag. Twenty million people uh, participated in the first Earth Day to save the earth. You see, we're just stewards here. God has loaned it to us for, what, three score, ten years, and then we're gone, somebody else is going to get that property? You don't own God's earth. Oh, we live on it for a while, but while we're living on it, we're supposed to take care of it. Adam and Eve were created to take care of the garden. Not to destroy it. Not to ruin it. Christian ecology has a basis in this and several other passages of Scripture. You know, when somebody borrows something from you, and being a dad, when your kids borrow stuff, your tools, don't you wish it would come back to you the same way you gave it to them? Or usually, I was taught, you bring it back better. Right? We just borrow what little piece of earth that God gives us. When it comes time for us to give it back, should it be in the same condition or better than when He gave it to us and loaned us to us as stewards to take care of? That's all we are. We're stewards of God's earth. After this announcement, the 24 elders who appear frequently in the book of Revelation that we've looked at and who were seated on the thrones uh, were seen uh, by John as falling on their faces to worship God. As to their identity, we've talked about that before. The elders who sat upon the thrones and around one throne, worshiping the one sitting on the throne. Their song of praise indicates that the time had come for God to judge the nations, to judge the dead, and to reward His servants. God was describing, or described as the Almighty, the Eternal One, who is and who was, and as possessing all power, dynamon, in general, their hymn of praise anticipates the establishment of God's rule over all the earth, which, by the way, is the theme of the Bible. You see, Adam and Eve, after that garden that they were given to take care of, decided, God, you're not going to be the boss of us. They moved out from under the rule of God, decided they could make it better on their own. And we've inherited that curse that came upon the earth because of their sinful disobedience to God. The whole rest of the Bible is how is God going to get Adam and Eve back under His rule, which we read about here. Well, in a most amazing way, He'd forgive them their sins. He'd become like them and die for them and shed His blood. See, He, doesn't, he gives us a free will. He doesn't make us love Him. So He came and showed us what love looks like on the cross behind us that perhaps, perchance, we might... Love Him back. Love Him back. God's plan of restoring mankind back under His rule. There will be a victory in which the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. There will be a time of terrible wrath in which the nations under the control of Satan will be put down and Christ's kingdom comes in all of its fullness and our God reigns. There'll be a final judgment and a final reward. The wicked who rebelled and rejected God's Christ will be delivered over to eternal punishment. The, righteousness, the righteous will re receive the inheritance promised to his saints. No matter what the kingdoms of this world look like today, no matter how out of control things may appear, in the end, God, our Father, wins. 
His kingdom wins. His rule is established over all. I never forget that essential truth that when the 24 elders, like the 24 elders, if we believe this, we too could fall on our faces and worship God in light of His great promises to those who love Him, those who obey Him, those who have their lamps full of Holy Spirit oil and are waiting, waiting for that day, waiting for His return, and who patiently pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is Your name. Thy kingdom come. You know, that's what faith is all about. When we believe, and He has shown us this in the end, then it's a done deal. Nothing's going to change this. This is the way it ends. Okay? I can live into that. I already know I have the victory regardless of what happens to me in this life. That's where the Bible talks about faith, hope, and love. These three. Hope. The Christian definition of hope is a reality that just hasn't taken place yet, but will. His kingdom is a reality. And it will put down all the kingdoms of this earth. It's just got to wait for His timing. Which is perfect, by the way. When that last soul, personally, I believe, that gets saved somewhere on this earth, even as I preach this morning, maybe there's some person just finally that God has been picking at is going to give in. And that might be the last one. And then the trumpet sounds. The temple. Let's look at that a little bit in our third and final point this morning. Revelation eleven nineteen says, And God's temple in heaven was opened, and within His temple was seen the ark of His covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. So I guess Indiana Jones was wrong. I mean, the ark isn't hidden in Egypt somewhere, was it? It says that the ark is in God's temple, that is, in the heavenlands. Verse 19 closes with another dramatic scene. I mean, for John to see the ark was quite a dramatic for him. God's temple in heaven was opened up for him to see and for him to tell us about it. At the same time, John was able to look into that temple where he saw the ark of the covenant. Now, this probably refers to the heavenly temple rather than to a temple on earth, though this is much debated uh, in many different commentaries, although some see this as a spiritual temple. And not a physical or a material temple at all. And later, we're going to see that uh, when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven in Revelation 21, the first thing John notices is there isn't a temple in it. There's no temple. Where's the temple? He says, because Jesus is there. Jesus is in the midst of that city. That's why there's no temple. Nonetheless, the corresponding results in the earth, however, include lightning, thunder, earthquake, a great hailstorm. Back in Revelation 8, 5, we read, Then the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar of, his, of the heavenly temple, maybe this very heavenly temple, and he hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes, and lightning, and an earthquake, depending on how the book of Revelation overlaps in these flashbacks. In Colossians 2, 16 and 17, we read, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day these are a shadow of the things that were to come the reality of these things are found in Christ which all those things in the temple the earthly temple the physical material temple were just pictures of the spiritual temple and what is in the heavens they were just shadows they weren't the reality Hebrews 8.5 says they serve in a sanctuary, speaking of the priests, the earthly sanctuary, that is a copy, that is a shadow of what is in heaven. Hebrews 8.5. This is why Moses has warned them that he was about when he was about to build the ta tabernacle, see that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. He wasn't able to uh, deviate from that blueprint because what they built on earth was a shadow or a reflection of an exact temple in heaven. John saw the heavenly temple, the Ark of the Covenant, that contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 10.2. You know, God said, I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, then you are to put them in the Ark. Maybe the Ark is there as a reminder of, of their covenant relationship with God and also their idolatrous ways in which right away God had to break the first set 
and put the second set in the ark because they were busy worshiping a golden calf and Moses hadn't even been gone very long. They were to be a constant reminder maybe of God's righteous standards. The presence of a heavenly ark of the covenant reminds us that God will never forget the provisions of his promises. Because of his mercy, because of his grace, because of the blood of a sacrificial lamb sprinkled on the ark where man meets with God by the high priest sprinkling using hyssop, there God grants access to his throne room to those who believe and those who receive the gospel of grace. Now, personally, I believe everything in the Old Testament and later Solomon's temple, again, were just shadows, shadowy, shadowy outlines of things to come. Things that we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. Namely, Jesus Christ and his gospel of the kingdom that he came and preached about. Jesus is the ark. Jesus is where we meet with God. He is the sacrificial lamb. He is the high priest who offered the sacrificial lamb for our sins. Jesus is the mercy seat on the ark in the Septuagint Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. The word mercy seat is the word propitiation. Christ has become our mercy seat. Christ has become our propitiation. Christ has become the place where the blood was sprinkled and we get to meet with God because he forgives us our sins because of that shed blood. Colossians 2, 16 and 7, Therefore do not let anyone judge you, again we read that earlier, by what you eat or drink or regard with religious festivals or new moon celebrations, all that religious stuff. These, those Old Testament ordinances and those feasts that he's talking about were merely shadows of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Christ fulfilled all those shadows. That's why in the New Jerusalem that comes out of heaven in Revelation 22, John says, there's no temple because Christ is there. The literal fulfillment of the shadows of the Old Testament. They were teaching aids. We call them visual aids. And I love to teach the tabernacle. Everything in that tabernacle points to Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ. John 2, verse 2 says, This is the atoning sacrifice. He uses the word, the propitiation, the mercy seat for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. In 1 John 4, 10, this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice. That is to be a propitiation, a mercy seat for our sins. Hebrews 8, 5. The Old Testament priests serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is heaven. And John is being shown that real temple in heaven that was opened up, and he's telling us about it. So again, the presence of a heavenly ark of the covenant reminds us that God will never forget the provisions of his promises. Because of his mercy, because of his grace, and the blood of a sacrificial lamb, we're able to go right into that throne room that he shows us where Christ is our advocate and worship God freely because our sins are forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ that we're going to celebrate this morning in communion. In conclusion, century ago, centuries ago, Jesus taught his first disciples to pray, Our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. When we look heavenward, the heavenly temple and its ark, where we find both justice and mercy. There we find law and we also find grace. But both are part of who God is and both are part of God's plan. We see the model of how things should be on earth. One day the ideal will be real. Faith will become sight. The hidden will be revealed and in the meantime, we can live our lives in light of both the justice of God and the mercy of God equally. As speaking about his justice, we read in Hebrews 9, 27, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. God is just. And sin cannot be gotten away with. If we had, like I said, a judge here in Baldwin County to let everybody off, you're dismissed, you're dismissed, you're dismissed, they'd hang him. But God is both love and justice. He's perfect justice and perfect love. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile the person. Sin is not something that we commit out here. 
Those are sins. Sin is what we are in here because we rebel against God and refuse to submit to His rule. We refuse to acknowledge our sinfulness and accept His free gift of salvation. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. We're all ragamuffin sinners. But Romans 6.23 goes on to say, For the wages of sin is death. That's the justice part. Listen, if you sow to the flesh, if you want to live that life, God gives you that free will. If you want to ignore God. But the wages of that kind of life is death. But here's the good news. There's also mercy. The gift of God, and it's a gift, is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I call, say with empty, open hands of faith, you just receive it. He did it all. He didn't need our help. You just believe it. The mercy part, John 3, 16 and 70, for God so loved the world, and I, that's the part I have a problem with. Why? We should all have been wiped out. But God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, our mercy seat, our ark, our propitiation, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life and a forever kingdom. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. That's what, not what He came to do. But to save the world through Him, and yet men refused to be saved. Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, put Him on the throne, His rule over all, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, that's gospel good news, you shall be saved. So why wait? Hebrews 2, 3 warns, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation, a mega salvation, this salvation was first announced by the Lord. It was confirmed to us by those who heard Him. God is fixing to answer the prayer of His church in His perfect time. In the meantime, I believe it's running out. And now is the time for men and women and children to get saved. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us sing as we prepare to come to this table this morning as we remember that propitiation, that shed blood. Please stand as we sing number 464. Please be seated. Did anybody forget? I'm usually the one that forgets to get a communion cup this morning. Yeah, we've got one there, Wayne. Okay. Anybody else? So, brothers and sisters, this is the table for the children of God. One day many will come from the east and the west, and the north and the south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. And our Savior invites all those who trust Him to share the feast that He has prepared. According to Luke, when the risen Lord was at table with His disciples, He took the bread. He blessed it, He broke it, and He gave it to them. And it says their eyes were opened and they recognized Him. And so it is with us when we come to this table and we think about Him, think about the cost for our great salvation. It did not come without a price. His shed blood. We too are renewed and meet Him there at His cross. 
So come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ, desire to be His true disciple. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of God, His mercy and His help. Come not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence. Let's take some time as we come to this table, as Scripture would invoke us to do, to examine ourselves and to remember Him. Let us pray. Scriptures tell us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us all of our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, and strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as they were delivered to the Apostle Paul, that, uh, for I have received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, how he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes again. And he is. He is coming again. Let us pray. O Lord of all, we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this cup. Unite us to your Son in his death and resurrection that we may be acceptable through Him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ our King, and bring us to that heavenly feast, where with all your saints we will be gathered in glory everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By Him and with Him and in Him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And again, printed in your hymnals there is also the Lord's Prayer for the Apostle Creed in the front of your hymnals. So let me let us pray together just the Our Father this morning as we gather at this table that is there. Our Father who art in heaven, may your name be held holy. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good if you take your cups this morning. Two layers there. Peel off that transparent one on the top very carefully. Careful not to squeeze that tub too, too much. You get purple all over you like I do. There you go. You peel that top back. You see the Eucharist. He said, this is my body. And it's for you. He gave it so freely to us. This is all I ask that you just remember me. Same way after that supper, he took the cup. Feel that second one back. This cup, he said, is the New Testament. That's that new heart that he's going to put in us to fix that old sin problem. The New Testament in my blood. And again, all he asks is that we remember him. And again, as 
often as we get to gather together, we don't know how much longer that will be until he comes. Until he comes again. So if you would now stand with me with the words of the, the benediction this morning. So God our help, we thank you for this supper shared in spirit with your son Jesus who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you even as in Christ you have served us. Amen.